Welcome to This Week in Intelligent Investing, where we examine timely and timeless investment topics to help you become a better investor. Enjoy authentic, unscripted discussion featuring Chris Bloomstrand, Phil Ordway, Elliot Turner, and other thought-leading investors. Brought to you by MOI Global. And now, here is your host, John Mihaljevic. A warm welcome to all of you listening to another episode of This Week in Intelligent Investing. We have a great discussion ahead with Elliot Turner and Phil Ordway. Chris Bloomstrand will rejoin us next week. Uh, let's just get right into it. I know you guys have prepared uh, a couple of really interesting topics that we can discuss. Uh, Phil, let's start with you. Sure. Thanks, John. So I thought for today I would talk about it, the power of incentives as it pertains to a somewhat narrower topic in that world, which is uh, stock-based compensation, which is something I find really, really interesting and and similar to the conversations we've had recently about dividends and buybacks and things. Just really, really strange in the way that it it seems to be stuck in this old way of thinking. I mean, again, it took seemingly forever to even get any acknowledgement that stock as a compensation tool should be expensed. <laughs> but, but here again, it just seems like in many circles, stock is viewed as funny money. Um, and it's just very odd. So I, what, what spurred me to take a look at this was uh, mostly self-interest. And I just sort of stumbled into this. So I know both of you guys know Twitter way better as a company than I certainly do. So I was, I was hoping you guys could weigh in. And, and there's just as a caveat here, again, I don't have a single dollar at risk in any of the stuff that I'm talking about um, directly anyway. So I, this is purely, I have no horse in the race and I, I'm totally agnostic about this stuff, but I'm just interested about it as a concept. And so I was looking at Twitter when the results came out, uh, I guess about a week ago, uh, and the stock declined pretty precipitously to decide if maybe there could be something interesting there. It's obviously a very powerful media platform despite all of its its flaws. And what jumped out at me that I just couldn't believe, had to rub my eyes and check a couple of times, um, was if you go back about six, almost seven years ago to early 2014, the stock price was actually way, way higher. It was approaching $70 a share. And after the recent decline, it's now down in the low 40s. Uh, it's about $43 as we record this. And that's a that's a really steep and, and painful drop. But then I looked and actually the market cap isn't down by very much at all because the share count has just exploded. And so again, unless I did something wrong, which I fully admit that I could have in, in terms of adjusting for what options were outstanding at the time, the share count has expanded by about 40% over that period, about 6% a year, a little over 6% in the year. And so they've been spending, I mean, even, even just year to date, if you take the number in the 10K from, from the beginning of February, and it was published in the beginning of February to the to the most recent 10Q that came out more, you know, a couple of weeks ago or last week, you know, the share count's been diluted by 2% just this year in nine months. Um, you know, so that's over a half a billion dollars of compensation right there in nine months on a on a base of 4,900 full-time employees. So on top of salary and benefits, every man and woman working at Twitter has gotten a, over six figures of stock compensation at Twitter. And it just begs the question, is that worth it? Is that a good use of Twitter's time, money, and resources, is that is that getting any sort of tangible benefit? Is there any reason to be doing it that way? If they really feel like their employees need that compensation uh, as a motivational tool, wouldn't it be more efficient and more common, based in more common sense to just pay them in cash? Uh, as, a, as an outside investor in Twitter, as an analyst of Twitter, it makes it much harder, in my opinion, to forecast the results you're going to get as an owner of Twitter over the next six or seven years. Uh, do, you, do you think this 6% a year dilution is going to continue or do you think it's going to be turned around at some point? And again, what's what's stunning, by the way, about Twitter over this time period is back in early 2014, the market cap was a little under $40 billion back when revenues were under a billion, but growing very rapidly. So in, in that year alone, revenues were going from about $750 million to almost a billion and a half, almost doubled in that time period. So growing very rapidly, but at a very high initial valuation, the company was burning a little bit of cash. So you fast forward to today, revenues have gone all the way up to almost three and a half billion. So they've grown tremendously. They've basically tripled 
uh, and the company's gone from burning cash to actually generating quite a bit of cash. Users have gone up by tens of millions. I mean, you could debate whether they've gone up enough or they've squandered their opportunity. But look, it's a very powerful media platform. It's gotten you know, people elected to the highest office in the land. It's turned the world upside down in a lot of ways. It's a very useful tool in a lot of ways. It's a very dangerous tool in other ways, which is beyond the scope of this. But the, the business itself has performed very well over those six or seven years. If you were to have owned it as a single owner over that period, I don't think you'd be disappointed in the results that you would have earned for yourself. But as an outside owner with all this dilution, you know, that's how you get this really sharp and painful drop in the in the price per share. And then, you know, just as a way of complimenting it to a couple of other very high profile peers, you know, we're all aware of the, the insanity, frankly, at Tesla, uh, where, you know, a controlling shareholder who is already enormously wealthy uh, um, and, and presumably had every single possible incentive based on common sense and his own pronouncements to to make the company successful was granted just an insane amount of stock, um, which is now paid off with one of the biggest single grants in the history of the world. But it doesn't have to be that way. So if you look at a peer like Netflix or Amazon, and again, a, a peer just in the sense of they're very successful, uh, growing companies, I, I guess, all located in the same general region of the world. Amazon, over the same period that I just cited, um, has seen a total growth in the share count of less than 8% or about a 1% growth rate per year, 1% dilution per year. Uh, Netflix has seen even less. Netflix total comp or, or excuse me, total shares outstanding has grown by only about 4% total over that six and a half, seven year period, um, which is far less than 1%, about 60 basis points of dilution a year annually. Um, so I, I don't know. It just strikes me as very, very odd. I wonder how you guys evaluate this, if it if it matters um, in how you view a business. I mean, part of me thinks I find it very difficult to forecast. Part of me thinks it's dumb management. Part of me thinks it's almost distasteful and a poor way to run a company because you, you have these exemplars. I mean, again, I think beyond the scope of whether Amazon and Netflix are going to be successful from here and beyond the scope of whether or not they're an attractive investment from here, they're exceptionally well-managed companies. They're amongst the best managed companies I've ever looked at. And so there, there are these examples out there of kind of doing governance the right way. And uh, I just wonder why a company like Twitter can't see that or can't get there. And, and, and again, I, I just don't see any evidence anywhere that, that this is helpful to the company. I mean, it, it sort of gets to the point, too, of like, you know, private fund management, which is something I think about in, in debate all the time with people. is like, you know, you go back to the old 2 and 20 structure, which was basically a historical accident in a lot of ways kind of numbers with the ultimate anchoring bias. Did it really help anyone's motivation or intrinsic motivation if the number was 2 and 20 versus something a little more reasonable and palatable and aligned with the ultimate LPs? I, I certainly don't think so, at least amongst the great fund managers or the really good fund managers that you'd want to be partnered with anyway. So it, it's sort of the same thing. It's like, you know, do you want to have as much stock-based compensation as you could possibly get away with? Or do you want to do the more reasonable thing and the more right, more, the more correct thing that's uh, a little more palatable. So anyway, just curious for, for what you guys would, would think about this topic. All right. Yeah. I mean, I appreciate you uh, bringing up and focusing on Twitter here um, and appreciate that you're uh, looking past just the MDAU line on the earnings from last week. Doesn't seem like many are. Um, that's a different <laughs> story, but you know, and again, I just to disclaim it one more time, I don't have an opinion. I'm not trying to like, you know, call this out. I just, it, it was stunning to me looking at it because I was looking at it as a you know, fresh set of eyes. And so again, I don't mean to throw any sort of as cast aspersions at all on the company or whatever. I'm just trying to like genuinely go back to the basic principle here of like, why do this? Like why issue this much stock as compensation? Yeah. So no, I, and I think it's a really good question. And it's one of the things I grappled with most when I first got involved with Twitter. Um, and I think part of the backstory is really important to kind of explain how we got here. Because when Twitter went public, the market's expectations were just way out of whack with the reality of the business. And I think the market was assuming, and Twitter was playing into it, that this was the next Facebook They'd get to um, the revenue scale of Facebook in no time, and they were worth that much, you know, pretty, pretty much right away. 
And so they went public with these sky high ambitions and a lot of employees ended up in a situation where they had a lot of um, RSUs and vested equity from pre-sale of pre-IPO, but they were locked up. And then between the time when their uh, vested stock and their options became real and when their lockup ended, um, they had to pay phantom tax and then the stock collapsed and a lot of people got stuck paying more money on tax than they were able to sell out of their stock when all was said and done. And you know, uh, employee competition and retention is really challenging and important in technology. Um, you have to keep your employee base motivated. You have to keep them happy. Um, and you have to keep up with the Joneses, what everyone else around you is doing. Um, and it was so bad that, um, you know, the, the churn in employees kind of accelerated. The churn in upper management was really severe. And when Jack came back in 2015, he actually contributed $200 million of his own uh, equity into the employee bonus pool because simultaneously, so many people had been burnt by the trajectory with which things uh, played out. And um, stock comp was so high to kind of try to get people back to a level of wealth that they had before um, that, you know, it would look bad to kind of dig even farther into the wealth. Um, I do think there was a meaningful inflection uh, in 2018 uh, at, in the rate with which they are compensating employees, both relative to revenues and the existing share count. And so I think they have been explicit. They said that this is the end of that sort of behavior. Um, and so without that, I really, you know, I, I, I wouldn't have felt quite as comfortable as I am right now. Um, so, you know, I think, I think the narrative is really important for contextualizing like the broader story. If you look at the last two years, the dilution was like, you know, I think it's less than one third the rate that they had each of the prior, uh, three years as a public company. Yeah, that, I, I think you're right. I mean, it's on pace this year to be about half of the, the prior rate, right? I mean, they're, they're on pace to issue about, they have about 3% dilution, but again, Again, I mean, so I, I'm with you. Like, it is it fair to characterize then that, and this is some of the context I was only vaguely aware of, that they basically screwed up the structure by having too much exposure from their own employees' perspective to the stock price when they went public because the expectations got out of line with reality and a lot of their employees were upside down and they were hemorrhaging uh, employees and, and, you know, just things were, were messed up on that basis. Is that a fair way of characterizing the, the situation back then? Absolutely. Okay. So that, that all makes sense. I, that I'm fully on board with that, but isn't it still their fault a for doing that? And so why having learned that lesson, do you see so many companies still committing that same mistake? And then secondarily, fast forwarding to today, I mean, this is still a huge, huge number we're talking about, right? And it has big implications for the margin structure and the cash generation and the, you know, the outlook for the company going forward if you're going to be spending two-thirds or three-quarters of a billion dollars of comp in, in non-cash stock expense. Yeah, you know, it's hard to say anything other than this is what all their peers do, therefore they have to play ball the same way everyone else does. Although I did see something interesting from Roku uh, a couple weeks back. What they announced was their executives could now choose to take extra stock in lieu of cash compensation. Um, and it's a model I wish more companies would follow instead of just giving people this equity where it's really comp and the design is to sell it to actually end up with cash in your pocket. This is almost the opposite. It's like, we're willing to pay you cash. However, if you so choose to, if you desire more equity, you could opt for that instead. And I, I prefer, or opt in, then kind of spit out cash uh, <laughs> options. So yeah, you know, I'd love to see more companies be creative and try to think more in terms of like having ownership be a choice than a form of comp that's like kind of playing fast with the perception of what actual expenses look like. Um, so I don't really have a defense for them, but the only thing I could really point to is. Um, there was a good study by Empirical, and I forgot exactly when it was, on what uh, valuations look like in high stock comp versus low stock comp companies and what 
total shareholder returns look like over the long run in similarly situated companies. And their conclusion effectively was it just doesn't matter. Um, if the company delivers and performs, then it's going to work as a stock. Um, and so, you know, I know that's not uh, necessarily comforting, but at the end of the day, uh, if Twitter executes, it's going to be just fine. And that's how I kind of help myself sleep at night, maybe. Yeah, I guess I agree in general that if the company works, well, it'll deliver. But again, I think the combination of valuation and this structural issue can disprove that on an individual basis, right? I mean, again, if you had bought stock at 68 or $69 a share in early 2014, even though the company has done quite well since then, you'd be way, way underwater, way, 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 way behind the market. So it doesn't, doesn't do you much good. Now, again, from here going forward, it's a different analysis. It's not, not the point of it. And I agree with you, actually, by the way, 100% about the, you know, that's what they felt like their peers were doing and they felt like they had to play ball. That's probably the single most uh, determinant factor in these sorts of analyses. But that's why I find it so odd is because it is still, I don't know what the numbers would be as to how pervasive it is, but it certainly seems like the majority of similar companies are structured this way, but it just doesn't have to be so because at least at some level, you know, Twitter would be competing against, you know, companies in, in roughly the same industry where there are examples that this doesn't have to be done this way. And that's, you know, so I'm reading Reed Hastings' new book that he co-authored. Um, same. It, and it's just interesting how he learned about a lot of these things uh, from his first company. And, and, you know, I know this wasn't necessarily Jack Dorsey's first company, but I don't know. It's just if I were him, you know, this is not, how I'd want to structure it. I think it it creates actually perverse incentives that tie your hands and are are quite problematic. I mean, I think about it in a somewhat similar, if you really squint kind of industry, at least tech and software, um, different country. But Mark Leonard at Constellation has really struggled with this in terms of how to incent people. And they pay cash bonuses, but want you to buy the stock yourself, which is far more efficient just in a, you know, kind of commonsensical approach. But it does have a lot of the same problems in, you know, you don't want your people to get tied up with a stock price that's inflated because that doesn't do any good for anybody. So I, I don't know. I mean, I guess if I were the benevolent dictator of one of these companies, um, I would probably choose a different path and pay people extremely well based on a very high performing standard, a high culture. I mean, I think the way if you're reading the book, Elliot, you know, the, the performance levels and it's like, we want, talent density. We want great people. And if you don't perform that level, we're going to be extremely generous, but you're just going to move along and you pay people at the very top end of their market. But I would just do that in cash and let them do as they please um, rather than issuing shares like this. It just doesn't... I, I, I'd i love to see some evidence and, and maybe there's some out there that I've missed. To your point, if, if maybe in the aggregate this comes out in the wash, because you're right, the determinant factor is just the direction of the business and how those changes can be so enormous that it'll swamp something like this even. But is there any shred of evidence or even an anecdote to support like, boy, we got this person because we paid them so much in stock instead of cash? Yeah, I, I mean, I'd imagine uh, it's not so much about we paid them in stock instead of cash, but it's uh, a combination of the allure that your stock could end up worth a whole lot more than when you were granted it. Right. But then they could just, if they believe that enough to come work at the company, and that's the narrative they're being sold even by the executives of the company, then just go buy it yourself with the cash you received. Mm. Right. I mean, compensation is compensation. I'm with you there. What do you think of the Roku model that uh, I mentioned? Yeah, that seems, yeah, that seems to make a lot more sense. Yeah. That's what I mean. And so there are these, you know, other ways of doing it. Right. Um, well, I think not, maybe, none are going to be perfect. And John, sorry, I didn't mean to, to interrupt you. I want to hear your thoughts on this. And so I guess I'm not trying to profess that I have the answer. There are plenty of ways to do this that are not all going to be the same. They're, they're going to need to be company specific and situation dependent. I'm just surprised that this particular model of like, and part of me is in a cynical way wonders if it's because it flatters the optics on the page. I, I don't know. It just yeah. I think I, that's kind of where I was gonna go. Is that you know part of the blame has to be with the investment community because yeah, I feel like a lot of investors are very willing to look past uh, stock based comp mm -hmm. and you know um, at least in the past I think a common practice was to basically you know 
exclude stock-based comp from kind of adjusted uh, profitability that's reported and quoted by the sell side. And if you went, you know, the other way of paying people cash and then they need to go out and buy the stock, that would be optically much, much worse for those companies just in terms of the way that a lot of investors look at this. So I think, you know, while each company is responsible for the policy that it has, um, you know, the the investment community kind of lets uh, the bad actors get away with it um, a lot of the time. Um, and, you know, we all know it's a real expense. I mean, there's there's real value being transferred to someone other than the shareholders. Um, and, you know, I, the general idea of incentivizing employees with equity-based compensation, I think there's definitely something to that because people feel more vested uh, with the company. Totally agree. Yeah. Um, but it's it's completely gotten out of hand. And, you know, you cited Tesla, that's probably kind of the craziest example. And there, I don't know how much the employees are getting. The bulk of that is going to Elon Musk, who really doesn't need any more incentive. Uh, so that's just a direct transfer of uh, wealth there. Right. Um, you know, with Twitter, I think the motivation, as, as Elliot pointed out with that um, kind of background and context, the motivation is um, can be understood and, you know, Jack Dorsey, my hat's off to him. I mean, he basically put his own money into the employee pool, uh, also, as Elliot mentioned. Uh, so, you know, there it's the motivation, I think, is very different than from what uh, is being done at Tesla. But nonetheless, I mean, you just have to take that into account uh, when when you're kind of valuing uh, these kinds of companies. Um, so I, I think part of it also, um, just finished with one last thought is kind of this really pervasive short termism that's in the market. And that just kind of has infected everybody, companies, investors, where basically, you know, if you have a really short term view, then the stock price volatility is going to be a much bigger driver than the share count, right? The share count kind of, you kind of mm. get diluted over time. You don't really feel it. I mean, it's kind of, even with the bad actors, it's like 1% or 2% a quarter, and it's kind of slow and steady. So, a, and a share price can go up 50% in a quarter. It can drop yeah, a, a lot. Point. So if you're really kind of looking out just one or two quarters, the fact that you're losing a tiny single digit percentage on the share count, you're not going to be that concerned about it. You're just going to be much more concerned about what's going to kind of drive the stock price. And, you know, that's part of why we see this happening, because a lot of investors are just not thinking as real long term owners uh, who actually would care very much about the share count. So I think you hit on two really important things, three really important things that explain it from the investor side and the executive side, which is the the nature, the timing of all this, because you're hundred percent, I mean, one or 2% dilution per quarter, five or 6%, seven, eight percent dilution per year. That's just going to be lost in the noise of normal volatility in any given year. And if the stock is right or wrong, it's going to be swamped by that outcome, you know, the outcome of the business and the stock price in general. So I think you're 100% right. And it just gets harder for that tiny fraction of people that might actually buy and hold it over that long period of time. And this is my criticism of that from the motivational perspective or the incentives perspective inside the company is that I think you're right, just like people that own the stock or are trading the stock or maybe, you know, naturally agnostic or even just dismissive of the impact because they're not going to be around to deal with the ramifications of it later. I think that's true of a lot of employees. I mean, the turnover at a lot of these companies is quite high. And so they all kind of delude themselves with this notion of like, oh, the number 15 person at Netflix or even Twitter or whatever became a centimillionaire because of all these, you know, stocks, the restricted stock units, options or shares that they were granted. Um, over a period of years early in the company's life, and that's going to happen to me too. And the fact remains that 
you know, very few people actually stick around at these companies for five or 10 years, except for the really senior original cadre of people at the very top. And so they just sort of all kid themselves that, you know, this isn't going it, to, it, it, it's just like the investor only looking out a few quarters or a few years. It's similar for these, you know, folks, they want to get as many shares in their possession as they can right now today and hope that in a year or two, three, maybe four or five at the very most, the stock will, will double, triple, quintuple, whatever, and they can be, they can sell it and move on. And, and I think going back to the original, you know, basis of this, which you'd think is, is good, which is good, which is we're going to motivate people by creating ownership, by giving them an ownership stake, which again, you can't argue with. I mean, that's perfectly valid. The problem with that, I think, is that it's the old adage about, you get in the most trouble with a good idea taken too far, which is exactly what you said. And I couldn't agree more. I mean, in another context, I've seen, I've seen entire funds of both the private equity and hedge fund variety, even some venture capital funds, I'm sure, completely blown up by this concept that we're going to give people, you know, below the top one or two folks, you know, a, a direct equity stake, and that's going to drive their incentives and, and create good outcomes. So you've seen all sorts of crazy decisions derived from that, that were totally counter from the long-term interest of the fund or even the long-term interest of the fund's founder who was making this decision. So I think it's really, really dangerous in that regard. And, and you often get the opposite of the intended, intended behavior. Well, you know, what's interesting is also it is a really crude compensation tool. I mean, if you were to craft a bonus for a person, you'd want that not just to be based on the overall company performance, but on that person's performance. And when you have so much of the variable comp tied up in stock comp, you are basically tying that person's bonus, if you will, kind of that upside that comes from the stock comp to the company's overall performance. And that's a little bit of like a socialist concept, right? Like you're going to do well if that behemoth does well, but you're not directly rewarded for your, you know, big or small contribution that's done then in the number of shares, but that's again, not directly related to uh, what your actual task is at the company. Um, so that's another thing. And, and I'll just kind of mention, I mean, I do view myself as a long-term shareholder and I and I'm sure Elliot is as well and I do own uh, Twitter um, so you know that's maybe a little bit at odds with what I just said previously but with Twitter specifically um, you know one is what Elliot mentioned that the stock comp is likely going to come down and has been coming down and you do have, um, you know, Elliott Associates involved and uh, Silver Lake as well. And I think they're going to be keeping a pretty close look on that. Um, but also, I think Twitter is the kind of business where you're not necessarily going to be adding one employee per one kind of unit of revenue growth. So revenue per employee is going to increase over time. And so I think the stock comp is going to matter less and less because the company can be a much, much more valuable company without needing to increase its employee base, you know, in the same kind of way. Yeah, That's fair right. enough. I, yeah, I think those are all great points. And, uh, you know, again, I and by the way, to address a prior point, I think it's very admirable that, you know, Jack Dorsey took some of his you know, that granted enormous wealth to to rectify some of the situation with the 200 million that you, that you had mentioned. I mean, that's just, not only is it good common sense, it's good leadership and it seems like it was the right thing to do. It's just, you'd also think that then every CEO in a similar situation would look at that as a case study of like, I don't really want to ever have to go back and do that or deal with that. And they'd find a different way of of setting this up. I mean, again, it just seems so much easier and cleaner to say, I'm going to run a great company. I'm going to do everything I can to run this company to the best of my abilities. I'm going to hire the best people. I'm going to pay them a lot. And I'm just going to keep it simple and clean. And it's going to be cash. I don't know. Yeah. Well, that's also one of the problems with like the path dependency of it all. Because um, if you have an extremely overvalued stock, what the hell are you supposed to do? If everyone's exactly. paid in stock, I mean, you're paying them in uh, hot air. 
Um, yeah. And it's not a fault per se. It's a design flaw. Right. Um, so yeah, I'm with you there. And similarly, I mean, the whole idea of some of these companies who just uh, do uh, annual repurchase to offset dilution, it's like, um, uh, I don't know, equally frustrating in that sense. Um, it's thoughtless and you could end up, uh, like why repurchase stock if you think it's way inflated anyway? I think the problem goes hand in hand. Agreed. Okay. Well, I think we've just about (laughs) run out of, uh, arguments to make on this. So Elliot, why don't we go to you for your topic of the week? All right. Yeah. Good to be back again. And I had a topic that I was thinking about a lot lately as I've gone through and, uh, you know, prepare for earnings season and think about some of the companies I'm looking at. Um, What I want to talk about today is um, one of my favorite analytical tools. And it's really a combination of tools, but it's like the starting point. And I think the most important part of my analysis when I put pen to paper and, you know, start looking at the numbers in a company. And I'm talking specifically about DCF and then within DCF doing a discounted cash flow analysis. What I really like, what I really like thinking about is um, doing a reverse uh, DCF, backing into what assumptions underlie today's stock price. Um, so I was first introduced to this idea in expectations investing by uh, Michael Mobson and Albert Rappaport. Um, And the idea is really quite simple. You could build a DCF and solve for what what assumptions get you to today's price. And obviously your goal is to be, you know, kind of uh, sensible with the assumptions that you're putting in there. And, you know, sometimes the market's not necessarily sensible, but still think in terms of like, use a margin structure that's feasible. So what level of growth does that imply from the market? You could then take it one step higher and, you know, build a pretty robust revenue model. So get to the unit economics of the business, whatever it may be, um, and figure out what are the key forces that drive revenue. um, And then have your revenue assumption, make your uh, margins that make the number work in the bottom of the DCF for today's stock price. Um, and then you, you know, once you have a working model, what you could really do is test like which assumptions is the model most sensitive to, um, whether it's in one of the drivers of the revenue uh, on the revenue side of things or in the margin structure of the business. Um, and you know, in playing around with which kinds of assumptions, which uh, variables you tweak, get you to today's price. Oftentimes, just in you know, messing around with the numbers, you get interesting insights. You get uh, some color on where the greatest sensitivities lie. Um, but then, you know, that's important in and of itself. But really, the most important takeaway is you have a really good sense of what you need to underwrite against. You have a really good sense of which variable and variables are the most important in the business. And you could then do your qualitative work to determine how reasonable or unreasonable any of those given assumptions are. So like many analysts build really good DCFs where the goal is to tell you the price, like the one true price the stock's worth or whether or even a range of prices. But I find far more value from working with, you know, what's embedded in today's price, uh, make all my assumptions explicit in building toward today's price. And then testing to see which ones I reasonably believe are, you know, over or under uh, aggressive and which ones I think are most or least likely to actually play out. Um, So, you know, that's, to me, the intersection between quantitative and qualitative analysis. And it's where I think oftentimes the best, most important insights come from. Um, I'll give you a specific example. Um, When I was working on PayPal and building up this way, I really noticed that by far the most sensitive variable in the entire model uh, all around from both its role that it plays in uh, revenue and the fact that you have no customer acquisition cost against it is engagement. So engagement meaning how many times per year or what, you know, how many times per year the typical customer uses PayPal. Um, and so, you know, in isolating on engagement, I could then simplify my thesis to so long as engagement's 
trending upward. I don't really need to worry about much else. And so, you know, that's how you could go from uh, quantitative to qualitative analysis to then, uh, you know, underwriting a thesis against it. And, you know, it's been one of the most important tools that I've been introduced to. I obviously, you know, kind of try to triangulate and use, um, you know, as much as I can to truly understand a company. Um, but, but this is like the most important for me. So I wanted to both share that and hear from you guys about how uh, your approach goes and what you think as well. Yeah, I completely agree that it's a powerful approach. I think it fits perfectly with one of the most important concepts in the world in terms of solving problems like this, which is when you're looking at a multi step difficult process, like what's this company worth or is this a good investment to own for the future? You break it into pieces and then you try to solve it by inverting it and turning it upside down. So looking at a a DCF style analysis backwards um, is, I think, exactly the right thing to do. And looking at the psychology of what the expectations are baked into the current price is is exactly the right thing to do. And so you you need that kind of parallel two-step process. And um, because, you know, again, I think the one danger and the reason you need both concepts of, you know, numerically backing into it in reverse what's what's priced in or what's appropriate. And it can focus you on the right things. As you said, the two or three things that are most important, I think that's exactly right. It can also give you a little bit of false sense of security, I think. And it, at least for me, particularly early on, I was kind of lulled to sleep in some situations by getting really deep and really granular on things. And, uh, you know, for people that are analytically or quantitatively inclined, I think that's a frequent temptation is to just completely miss the forest for the trees, which you can do here. But if you avoid that by, you know, looking also at the expectations in a more of a qualitative sense, you can avoid a lot of those mistakes. So, um, you know, if your numbers, you know, backed into the reverse DCF point to a, a pretty enticing proposition in one way, and you can marry that with a view that the expectations qualitatively are somewhat out of whack. I mean, that that really sets up is, is the perfect situation. And I do find it, um, again, very intriguing that so many people seem to do one but not the other. Uh, and there's a reason why that, that fantastic book is called Expectations Investing. It really does have both sides of it. Um, and I think it's absolutely the right way to do it and extremely powerful. I guess I'll just ask a question, Elliot, on... Um how you actually build this kind of a model uh, in terms of these key variables. Do you um, actually look at what a company discloses or would you have a variable in there that you can some sometimes that's important but is not disclosed and you'd have to figure it out for yourself? Like with PayPal on the engagement side, do you have that in there because PayPal discloses that number and it's you know, very transparent or simply because that's a variable that you decided would be a key variable? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And it's something I've been thinking about a lot lately, and I'll get to exactly where that comes full circle. But um, with PayPal, engagements are reported uh, uh, KPI, though I don't think they calculate it, right? I do it slightly different. Um, But I think it's important to think like if I were at this company, what would be the numbers I'd want to know to understand the unit economics of the business? Like how do you turn a relationship with the customer into a dollar of revenue and how does that dollar of revenue turn into margin? And so for example, with Roku, similarly, there's what I'd call the engagement like metric um, hours viewed per household uh, per day. And so, you know, I think that's important for a lot of reasons. Uh, You know, it directly translates into how many opportunities you have to serve someone with an advertisement. So how much revenue you can make. And it's also effective when you're comparing, you know, what share of people's TV time is being captured by Roku. However, the company doesn't report that number. They report everything else you need to get there. But it involves asking the right questions, like what would I want to know if I were like behind the wheel at this business and trying to understand it. So to bring it fully around, you know, like back to Twitter again, as an analyst, uh, you know, and when you look at the street, I'm not alone in this. We model Twitter based on what number of users we think they could have and what number, uh, what, what they're like 
revenue per user looks like. And obviously you could get to pretty fine degrees of granularity. They give you enough that you could kind of back into ARPU in certain key geographies and you could strip out data and just focus on the ad business and do everything individually and separately. Except there's a problem and it's when you, if you were sitting at the business itself and you were asking yourself, you know, what are the key drivers of ARPU? You know, there's nothing that they disclose publicly that we could understand to know it. And here I am in a model using ARPU as an input. But it's actually, if you really think about it, it's an output. And it's an output of a lot of different factors, but you'd also want to know how many advertisers there are on the platform and how much budget they're dedicating to the platform. Because if that number is fixed, it doesn't matter how many users you have. If you add users, that'll just put downward pressure on your ARPU. Um, so, you know, that's a real problem. And I feel like it, it, it impacts our ability to truly understand the business. And, you know, I think to, to the point about users, users are in some ways an output of other variables as well. So it's somewhat challenging in certain areas. Um, and, you know, that gets me to Phil's point about like missing the forest from the trees with granularity as an analyst. Um, I, I definitely think that's one of the risks and one of the problems. You know, you want to get everything to be granular and you want to get everything to matter. But you then don't necessarily know if you're using something that's an input as an output and an output as an input and vice versa. You know, if you, if you mess it up, you could lead yourself down some pretty harmful paths. Um, and to bring it back to PayPal, I think that's one of the things that really helped me in building the model that way and understanding engagement. Um, and it helped me build conviction in it because the typical person on the street was looking at the business in terms of like their, their, their most important variable at the end all be all um, was the take rate, uh, the, the transaction level margin that the company was able to generate. Um, and, you know, here, here I was thinking like, well, that's important, but like way, way, way less important than something else. So that helped me build conviction and focus on something. So, you know, I, I think it's it, it's hard. It's challenging. Um, you want to get as granular as possible. You want to ask the right questions and you want to make sure you're looking at things the right way. But oftentimes there's not enough to work with from the company. Uh, you could augment with certain kinds of alternative data, but even still that's often not enough and it's not a clear enough picture and there could be problems uh, with that. And, so, you know, th this is our job in making decisions with imperfect information, right? That's that's what we have to do. We have to weight which information is most and least important and which what we're what we're going to rely on. Yeah, look, I think I agree with almost every single word you just said, so I'm not sure how much I can really add here. I think this is the right way to do it. It's very smart. Um, it's easier said than done, I guess, is one caveat. So it helps to look for, you know, counter examples and things that where you would have done this, where it would have failed. So you can learn how it can lead you astray and how the numbers can paint a picture that doesn't end up developing. I mean, I guess the only thing I would add as to how I go about doing this is um, I would do the same sort of thing with an example like this, where you try to try to boil it down to a couple of things that are really going to matter. In this case, maybe ARPU, which are driven by users and engagement and, and sort of the overall uh, momentum of the business. And I do then try, and this is where I can get tripped up, um, particularly with some businesses in this general type of category, would be how does that ever eventually translate to cash? Because I, I just can't intellectually or practically get my hands around valuing a business that's functionally never going to generate much cash, even though it's growing in value, even though it's important, even though it's certainly valuable in, in just a general sense. Um, and, and to step it back even further, I mean, I'm always just trying to answer the question, is this company going to be more valuable two, three, five, ten 10 years from now than it is today? And there are plenty of ways for a company to be more valuable two to 10 years from today, even if it's not producing cash that I can value over that time period. It's just for me, it's so much less reliable to forecast that improvement in value um, that I get kind of nervous, for lack of a better word. So I'm always trying to triangulate between what really drives the changes in value over two to 10 years? And, and what are those metrics in, in both quantitative and, and in qualitative concepts? And then how does it tie back into cash that can be evidence of that value? And uh, again, it's, it's easier said than done, but this is, this is definitely the right way to do it. 
in my opinion. So true. I'll give you an example where I went wrong and it was exactly on that point. It was specifically in Grubhub and I, you know, kind of felt that, well, not felt, uh, you know, in building it out, I understood that as they scaled doing uh, turnkey logistics themselves, so Grubhub delivery in contrast to marketplace, um, they'd have some efficiencies that would eventually drop down to margin. And, you know, there were, there was an underlying assumption that was wrong, which was that they were pushing out geographies. So they weren't really growing into efficiencies. They were actually creating new inefficiencies. And, you know, I think the broader point that I make on that is it's the difference between looking for a company, like when you talk about a company who's not actually making cash money today, um, there is a big difference. There's, there's two kinds of companies that kind of fit that bill. One has proven unit economics that they're able to scale up by, you know, getting more of that unit into the business. So, you know, the more customers Roku gets to the more households Roku gets with their TVs, you know, the more money they, they, they make a pretty consistent amount of money per household. So they're scaling that up, which is great. But the alternative, the flip side of that is a company like Grubhub in turnkey logistics, who actually has to scale the business in order to get the unit economics to work. Um, so if they're not making money, I want to be extra sure um, that they are actually scaling proven unit economics and Instead of uh, trying to scale into eco- economics, um, if you if you know what I mean there. Sure. Yeah. So I guess I'll just kind of share my view on on this reverse DCF in general. I I, I would say I prefer it quite a bit to a standard DCF because I think a re- reverse DCF has a specific purpose and kind of is a better tool. I'm not really a big fan of just the normal DCF for valuing companies because A, it can kind of help you arrive at any conclusion that you want to arrive at. And, um, you know, B, I feel like if an investment is really, really compelling, you can kind of write it down or even value it on the back of an envelope. You don't really need a DCF. And, And C, that terminal value is always kind of this issue for me because if you have a company that will just grow above GDP for a very long time, that terminal value concept is a really tough one where you're potentially missing a lot of value. And um, so maybe Elliot, you know, you could kind of talk a little bit about that if you've had some experience with reverse DCFs and how that you know terminal value comes into play, uh, what component of the overall value it tends to be in the in the kind of uh, scenarios you're looking at, and because you know that that granularity of tweaking the KPIs, I assume that that's more in the period leading up to that you know terminal value. Yeah, no, that's a great question, and I think one of the more meaningful changes I made was after reading McKinsey on valuation, I had formerly done, you know, five years of DCF, slap a terminal multiple on it. And, you know, sometimes for really good companies, like you're saying, it had to be quite high. And by quite high, I mean, you know, typically in a terminal value, we want to use like, I don't know, talk about a 10% whack, two to 3% growth. And so, You know, you're talking about like fairly low overall terminal multiples. I mean, like what we're talking about something like uh, 12 to 14 times. But, you know, for like a really high quality cash gushing business in five years down the line, it's going to trade for more than 12 to 14 times. Um, And I don't want to be wrong because of that. So the next, what, what I really did, I think that was quite helpful from McKinsey on valuation was I added another three years to the DCF. So, you know, five years is extremely explicit. The next three years, some of the assumptions I get a little, uh, you know, tone tone things down from the first five years. And then in the terminal, uh, I'm then able to, you know, think about what would similarly situated companies trade like uh, today and over the last 10 years on average and and work from those uh, kinds of questions uh, to determine whether it's reasonable. 
I agree to an extent about like a really good thesis should be able to be back of napkin simple, but I find that, you know, I, I personally, that's, that, that's appealing high level to make the thesis and establish interest. But for me, if I want to have really big conviction in the stock, I really need to know exactly, you know, what I'm wagering on, so to speak. So that that's where I think that's really helpful. Like I want to know where and how I could be wrong. And I want to like in a Bayesian way, kind of assess my determination of what's important and what I expect uh, versus what happens as time marches on. So I could understand whether I truly have a good read on this business or not, whether I really understand it well or not. And if I don't, that's a good exit signal or a signal to at least reconsider everything I'd been working with to start, if you know what I mean. Yeah, sure. And I, I think it's a, it's a very important point. And again, I think it does have to be both, right? I mean, I think to John's point, it has to be compelling at a simple level, back of the envelope, back of the napkin, something you could explain in, in a couple of sentences to, to even an outsider. If it requires tons of, you know, spreadsheets to justify, uh, that's a bad sign. I think for me and, and I think in, in reality, but I think it, it should also be supported by, so the back of the envelope should also be supported by almost everything you can get your hands on. So the best, you know, things I've ever come across, the best businesses I've ever come across were both immediately and enormously compelling at a very simple high level. And then the deeper you dig every layer of the onion you peel back has something compelling and interesting and valuable. It, it you know, the more granular you get, the more interesting it is. Now, the problem, of course, is if you're wrong at the top level and you get diluted even further, you know, the farther down the rabbit hole you go, that can be exceptionally dangerous. But, uh, you know, to your point, that's that's what we're here to do is to take uncertainty and information and digest it down to odds via prices and and make our best attempt at, at assessing the future. But uh, I think it certainly has to entail both aspects. Yeah. And one, one other thing that's important to consider is like, you know, oftentimes the best investments, you, you can't really consider within a DCF where some of the value will come from, you know, who wrote AWS into their Amazon investment in, exactly. in like yep. 2005. Um, so it involves that sort of kind of uh, holistic analysis of management, what they're trying to drive toward how they think, you know, how disciplined they are with their own capital. And, you know, line extensions are a big part of value in, in some really great growth companies. Uh, I think one of the more interesting frameworks I've, I've encountered from that, if you read the old New Horizon Fund within T. Rowe Price uh, letters from uh, Henry Ellenbogen, he talks about looking for companies that have built, built an Act One and are preparing for an Act Two. Um, and have the pieces in place to go at it. So, uh, you know, that's something that I think about, but I don't necessarily put in the numbers. Um, don't want to underwrite to that, but treat it as a form of optionality. And I, and I do think about the going back to John's point about the interesting part of starting with the end and, and inverting the process of a reverse DCI. I do think it's helpful in this sense to think about it in terms of the dollars and to not get anchored on something like the terminal value or the terminal multiple. Because, you know, frankly, to me, it would be sobering to say, is this company that is either burning a lot of cash or has a very small revenue base or something like that, you know, is this company with a with a $500 million revenue base really worth $40 billion, right? Is this company ever going to produce $40 billion of cash value to me? Now, there's lots of ways to get there. It can be sold. It can be, you know... You, you can the stock price can just go up and you can sell it. I mean, there's, but the, in terms of actually valuing the business, starting with that result and just as a quantitative, uh, common sense check on that quantitative process, you know, just say what what do we have to believe for this to be worth forty billion today, and and backing into that, I think is is extremely helpful. It's a very good point. A lot of companies out there right now that I think some people should be asking that question with. Yeah, exactly. And, and again, I think what's so interesting to me is uh, contrary to the popular narrative, at least in my judgment, which is imperfect for sure, I've been wrong about plenty of these specific things and, and even some things in general in the past several years, of course, but I don't see a lot of craziness in the best companies, the really, really good companies. Now, look, could Amazon or Netflix or whomever prove to be 
overvalued at this price? Absolutely. That's entirely possible. And I'm not making a judgment or rendering any sort of opinion in either direction there. But I think that's, it, it's not clear, I guess, but it's part of why I'm not willing to run it. But you look at some of these other companies that have just been absolute rocket ships and have driven, you know, a substantial part of the market performance in their little niche. I, I mean, that is just, there's some really, really difficult assumptions baked into some companies that are not very likely to be the next Netflix or Amazon or the next AWS within a company or whatever, right? It's just the odds are crazy to me. And what the expectations that are baked in there is crazy. Totally agree. The line extensions are a, a must to not just a, you know, kind of call option on top of what's already there in a lot of those cases. One kind of a little bit dry uh, topic here, but I feel like is important with regard to DCFs is always the discount rate or the interest rate. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how you guys see that? Um, because we are still in this environment where the market interest rates, especially kind of the long-term rates, may not reflect reality or, or kind of a market a rate. So what, what are you using in your models? You know, I haven't really changed too much on that front. Um, I kind of, uh, for some of the earlier growthier businesses, you know, I, I, I don't try to use like high, medium, low uh, discount rates just to be, you know, just for the sake of it. I try to really think about what the cost of capital is for the company um, and try to get something that's relevant for them. But I don't want to, you know, go, if you go too low, the, the assumptions start getting crazy. So I'll use something like 10% for most companies I work with. Um, and then, you know, obviously I, I do think the terminal value is going to capture a lot of the value. And what I've started doing is just using uh, actual multiples that are based on like looking at histories of reasonable ranges for the industry, for the kind of company it is, for the rate at which I expect it to be growing in the exit period and all that. So I try to kind of take myself out of looking at, at, at the actual number there and, and think more in terms of like general worth. Um, I'm not sure if that's right or wrong, but um, I definitely don't feel comfortable with where I've seen certain analyses shake out, slapping like six or seven percent on on some companies out there. It seems kind of crazy, um, but I don't know. Curious, uh, Phil, how do you approach that too? Yeah, I think you have to acknowledge that interest rates are financial gravity, um, to borrow the phrase, and and so it absolutely matters. But at the same time. I consider at least two things. One is a, is an absolute lower bound below which I'm not willing to value companies using a, disc a discount rate that's particularly low given the current market environment for a whole host of reasons, but pertaining basically to the uncertainty about my not wanting to make an investment today that's predicated on a level of interest rates where I could be proven wrong if those interest rates go up dramatically. Um, so I tend to stick to a very uh, um, steady, absolute level of a discount rate that I use. And it's, I won't disclose it just because I don't think it's helpful for other people to, to use a number that's based on someone else's assumptions. And the reason for that is because the number that I pick is based entirely on uh, my own opportunity costs. So I, I really do assume uh, for analytical purposes in a hypothetical sense that I control all of the companies in the portfolio and that I am going to earn a certain return from owning those companies in the portfolio. And therefore, my opportunity cost is, is basically that, that result or the second best return in that portfolio. And so if I'm going to be allocating dollars from A to B, it's because I think I can earn at least that, of course, right? So I certainly don't adjust the discount rate up and down based on how risky something might be or whatever. I mean, I have to have some level of, of certainty within a wide range, of course, as to what those returns and cash flows will look like. Um, but it's not like I'm using a 3% discount rate on something that I think is just rock solid and a 20% some discount rate on something that looks really, really dicey and has a lot of hair on it. So I, I just think that's prone to increasing the band of the range of error rather than decreasing it. So I think by sticking to a relatively stable, um, frankly, relatively high um, discount rate causes you to have more errors of omission where there are things that you pass up 
that, that you might otherwise be willing to hold your nose and buy, uh, but it also drastically decreases the amount of mistakes you're going to commit where capital is actually going to be flushed down the tubes. Really good point, sir. Yeah, and, and actually, Phil, I think your point is spot on that the discount rate probably should be kind of a personalized rate. You know, like what what is the cost of capital that you require or that, you know, what's the that you require, right? As as the investor. It's not necessarily right. what's a market cost of capital, right? I mean, um, that can be very different for different people. Very different. And I would just caution everybody to do that, but to also consider the lower bound, right? So it would be a crazy outcome for someone to say, you know, I'm going to retire. I want to live on this portfolio of investments and I can only make, you know, two or 3% on this portfolio of fixed income. Therefore, my opportunity cost discount rate is two or 3% and I'm going to go value this, you know, so you know, this, this investment in the equity of some highly leveraged company at two or 3% or, you know, some, some cash burning, high growth tech company or whatever. I mean, that would lead you to then say, I'm going to have everything I own in a portfolio of that kind of stuff at some very difficult expectations, which gets back to what we were talking about earlier, where you have to have that, that second check of what the expectations are that are baked into the price. So that's why it's an imperfect, imperfect art. There is no, true hard science about what what number to pick and what number to use. It has to be, you know, a blend of what the market is offering and a blend of what you realistically think you can offer as, as a return to yourself in your own portfolio based on a realistic realistic assumption of, of what's available to you and what you can actually invest in that you can understand and that will, you know, on balance at the bottom line, provide you that return over the coming period of years. Yeah, great. Um, well, I think we've uh, covered a lot of ground here. Um, do you guys have any any final thoughts, anything to add before we wrap it up? I, I would add one one more line on discount rate. If I'm wrong because I picked the wrong discount rate, I messed up big time. You know, good good point. Yeah, can you yeah, just that elaborate? should not be the determinant factor, right? Oh, okay. Yep, exactly. Got it. Exactly. It means I've made some other really big mistakes somewhere along the way. So I, I don't stress it too much at the right, end of the day. Right, right. Makes sense. It gets back to the concept, I think, what you were saying, which I always try to preach to people in a very uh, simplified way, which is business first or security first. If you're looking at the business first to produce the results, the business should be good enough that kind of no matter what finely tuned financial assumptions you put into it, you're still going to get somewhere between a pretty decent result and a really good result. And again, mm -hmm. if if a discount rate, but you know, if you have to crank the discount rate all the way down to two or three percent to even get into the range of acceptable, and if you get it up to seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve percent, you know, you're underwater. That that's just a disqualification right there. Exactly. Great. Well, on that note, guys, thank you so much. Another great discussion, and thanks everyone for listening. Looking forward to. Uh, Talking to both of you and Chris uh, next week. Take care. Thank you for listening to This Week in Intelligent Investing, brought to you exclusively by MOI Global, the research-driven membership organization. Learn more at moiglobal.com.